It was the day that I returned to the office after Christmas. And I was packing up my bag and preparing to head out the door when my son David chased after me and said, Dad, Dad, wait, wait. Don't forget your trophy. Now you can hold your applause to the end, but I don't mean to brag, but I recently was bestowed a trophy. You see, my son David had gone to school before Christmas and they had a Wonderland gift shop at his school and so he purchased for me a trophy that reads on it, Star Dad, evidently paying homage to when we had gone to Hollywood Studios and gone to the Star Wars exhibit uh, where we loved it all together as a family. He had purchased it and he said, make sure you take it to work in his words so that I would remember him while I was at work. Not wanting to be outdone, of course, Bella quickly took a bookmark and etched a heart on it and said, Dad, take this and remember me too before you go. (laughs) Each gift had a singular purpose. My kids wanted to help me remember. They wanted me to remember their love, but more importantly, they wanted me to remember them as if I could ever forget, right? It's like the book of Isaiah says, in Isaiah chapter 49, when the prophet writes, can a mother forget the baby at her breast? Can she show no compassion on the child that she has born? The implication is, even if she could forget, the Lord says, I will not forget you. What a beautiful thing to be remembered. And some of the biggest gifts and some of the best gifts that we give to one another are designed to tell people that we remember them, that they came to mind. Sometimes we send letters to people just to say, I'm thinking of you. In fact, if you were to go to Hallmark, there's an entire section entitled Thinking of You. It's a beautiful thing to be remembered. So it's no surprise to me that the New Testament is actually filled with the same kind of letters where the Apostle Paul is telling the people, I remember you. But Paul connects memory with action. In the book of Ephesians chapter 1, he writes to the churches around Ephesus, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. To the church in Philippi, a church that was special and dear to him, he wrote these words, I thank God every time I remember you. And perhaps, And most poignantly, to the man who he calls his true son in the faith, the one who he has groomed to become his successor, Paul writes these words, I constantly remember you in my prayers. So for the Apostle Paul, memory is tied to action. When he remembers, he prays. Which, just as a quick aside, before we even get to our focal passage for today... Have you ever had the experience of somebody you have not thought about for a period of time all of a sudden jump back into your mind? For example, this last Monday, I had a dream about a man I haven't seen for probably about 15 years. He was the table later at a three-day retreat weekend that I went on called The Great Banquet. His name was Chad, and all of a sudden, after years and years, Chad showed up in my dreams. And so I woke up the next morning, and I thought, maybe this is just a little God nudge to pray for Chad, And so my morning prayer routine had Chad in it. Maybe when you have that experience of somebody coming to mind you haven't thought about for a little while, maybe that's God nudging you also to take a step toward action and pray. Memory is intended to be connected to action. In fact, our scripture reading for today is a gift that Jesus gave to his disciples before the greatest gift that he would give to his disciples And it was a gift intended to help them sharpen their memories so that it would change the way in which they live. Our scripture passage for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. Hear now the word of the Lord. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at table. And Jesus said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, 
and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How's your memory? I'm sensing from the gentle mutter around the, crowd, the audience today that, that uh, perhaps it could use a little bit of work. I used to have a friend who would tell me, I've got a memory like a steel trap, dot, dot, dot. It just leaks. Or my dad used to say to me when we were kids, he'd say, I've got a memory like an elephant, because apparently elephants have really long memories. I've got a memory like an elephant, he'd say. It's just short. How about you? How's your memory? You know, when we're young, our memories are pretty great. They're like little sponges that easily absorb new information and retain it for a long time. But as we start to get older, it becomes more and more difficult to remember things. Expatriates have actually found this to be true. Those who have moved from the United States to another country across the world where there's another language spoken, if they don't speak the language before they've got there and they've traveled with a family, often find that while the adults, mom and dad, work really hard in language acquisition, it takes the children very little time at all. I sort of wonder about the Kim family, Pastor Sue and Christina, who've gone to Thailand and are learning the Thai language. I wonder if they're going to spend hours and hours and hours in language acquisition and, and little Timothy... Little Timmy's just going to pick it up like nothing. Because when we're little, our brains are like little sponges that easily pick up new information. But as we get a little bit older, our minds crystallize. And it's a little bit more difficult for us to retain new things. Which is why we develop tools and strategies to help us remember. Do you have any tools and strategies to try to keep your mind sharp? How many of you do puzzles every day in order to keep your mind at work? Crossword puzzles, Sudoku... Wordle, I'll allow it. How about, um, how about, how many of you read on a daily basis to continue to cultivate your mind, to keep it sharp? Right? We develop these strategies because time, it seems, has this effect of dulling our memory, taking the once razor sharp edges of it and dulling the sides like a knife after it's been used can become a little bit more dull, so our memories over time become dull so that we develop strategies to help. And some strategies are more tangible than others. How many of you have ever had a pill container at home? (laughs) A pill container is a tangible symbol that helps you remember. Now, pill containers don't help us remember that we need to take medicine, right? If you were to go to the doctor and the doctor were to ask you, uh, what medications are you on? You'd easily tell him, well, I'm on Zeralto for da 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 and I'm on Zestatin for this, and I'm on... Um, you'd be able to tell him all the medications you're on. So a pill container doesn't help you remember that you take medication. Rather, a pill container reminds you that you need to live as though you need to take medication. If, if you go to home after worship today and you find that your Sunday container is still closed, you have not lived as though you need to take medication. Which raises an interesting point. There is sometimes a discrepancy between what we remember and how we live. Like we remember that the doctor tells you that you need to eat healthier, and yet the holidays were just here, and there were so many tasty treats that all of us are now making New Year's resolutions for how to stay fit. Sometimes there's a discrepancy between memory and action. But the Lord knows this. So throughout the scriptures, we see that the the Lord of the universe has given us different memory tools, mnemonic devices to help us not only live and remember, but to live like we remember. It's not that the people of the ancient world forgot to be religious. Almost everybody in the ancient world was religious, but they forgot to live in light of the fact that the one true God was their God. Take, for example, the story of the Exodus. You remember the story of the Exodus? The story of the Exodus goes something like this. God's people, Israel, had become enslaved to the most powerful empire in the ancient world. So God chose a man by the name of Moses to go to the most powerful man in the world and say to him, let my people go. When Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt, refused Moses' request, 
the Lord sent plagues upon the Egyptians, ten of them in all, the last of which was the death of all the firstborn sons of the Egyptians. And the Lord then gave the Israelite people a way in which to get out of this tenth plague. If the Israelites were to slaughter a lamb, to place the blood of the lamb over the doorposts and on the side of the door frame, then the Lord, when he passed over Egypt, would pass over the homes of the Israelites and spare the firstborn children of the Egyptians. And every time I've read this passage, I've come to think the Lord did this because he couldn't dif- differentiate between the Egyptian homes and the Israelite homes, but I don't think that's true. Rather, I think what's really happening here is the Lord gave the people a way to remember what the Lord had done. God had delivered the Israelites through the blood of the Lamb. And that then would be the symbol that they would continue to celebrate and remember. In fact, right after the Exodus, the Lord gave to the people a command to celebrate, to commemorate that day forward. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 14, the words are written. It says, this is to be a day that you are to commemorate. For the generations to come shall celebrate it as a festival of the Lord, a lasting ordinance. Each year following the Passover, as it was called, each year following the first event, the Israelites, around the first of the year, their January, would celebrate at the very beginning of the year what the Lord had done in delivering them through the blood of the Lamb. And they did it by means of a feast. The table was set with different elements, each of which reminded them of the story of how God had delivered them with a mighty arm and an outstretched hand. Each of the symbols reminded them of their affliction of their tears and their sorrow and their hard labor, but more importantly, it reminded them that the Lord had delivered them from all those things. And it was around that table, the Passover feast, that Jesus gathered with his disciples. It would be just a couple of days before he would offer his life as a sacrifice for the sins of humanity. Jesus gathered with his disciples and he reinterpreted what the significance of that meal was all about. Luke 22, 15 said, Jesus said, I have eagerly desired to share this Passover meal with you. Now, because most of Jesus' disciples had left their fathers and mothers to follow after Jesus, Jesus takes the role as the head of the household as they're celebrating the Passover feast. That role was a significant role. When the people were gathered around the table in the home, the head of the household would take bread. It was unleavened bread, which reminded them of the haste in which they left Israel, because when Israel, when they left Egypt, because when Israel left Egypt, they left in such haste that they didn't have time to put the leaven in. So the head of the household would take unleavened bread. He would hold it up and bless it. He would say, blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth from the ground. And he would break the bread and distribute it among the people and say, whoever is hungry, let him come and eat. Whoever's in need, let him keep this Passover with us. Jesus, you can almost hear those words coming out of his mouth as the head of the household, can't you? But then Jesus adds some other words to it. He said, this is my body, which is broken. Do this in memory and remembrance of me. You see, Jesus took this meal that was deeply rich in significance, and he reinterpreted it in light of what he was about to do. The meal was a symbol of God's deliverance from affliction to slavery in Egypt, and Jesus reinterpreted it to be about the deliverance of God's people from their affliction and their slavery to sin. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. So since that time, Christians have gathered around this table, remembering what Christ had done for them and delivering them from their sins. So impactful was this meal that it became the way in which disciples recognized Jesus when two of the disciples were on their road to Emmaus and they encountered the risen Lord and didn't immediately recognize him. It was through the blessing and breaking of bread that their eyes were opened and they recognized their Savior. 
Then Jesus took the cup. Also after supper, it said. Why does it say also after supper? Did you notice in Luke's account, there's actually two cups? There's a cup that is blessed and taken. Then there's the bread that's broken. Then there's another cup that's blessed and taken. Why are there two cups? Because they were celebrating the Passover meal. In a traditional Passover meal, there actually would have been four cups, each of which was deeply symbolic about the life of what God had done in Israel. The third cup, which was taken right after the meal was celebrated, was called the cup of thanksgiving. Tradition held that that cup would be offered in honor of Elijah, petitioning him to herald the coming of the Messiah. Luke's gospel has already told us that the Messiah has come because John the Baptist came in Elijah's spirit. And John the Baptist heralded the coming of Jesus, the Messiah. And so Jesus holds up the cup that was talking about heralding the coming of the Messiah. And he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, which is in my blood. It's the cup of the covenant in my blood. Let's go back once more to the story of the Exodus. God had delivered his people through the blood of the Lamb, And then out in the wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula, God offered to the people a way to have a relationship with God. In the scriptures, that's called a covenant. And the biblical language is that a covenant was cut. Because every time a covenant was cut, a sacrifice was offered with the blood of an animal. So God makes a covenant with the Israelites out in the wilderness And then the Israelites are read the entire covenant, including the Ten Commandments, and they say, everything that is written, we will do. A sacrifice is offered, and Moses takes the blood of the sacrifice. He calls it the blood of the covenant, and he sprinkles it on the people to ratify the reality of their new relationship with God. So Jesus is gathered around this table of deep significance, and he takes the cup, and he says, this is the cup of the new covenant covenant, which is in my blood. In this moment, Jesus embodies the role of the Passover lamb. That new covenant is significant language. It comes from the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 31, Jeremiah writes about the time that is coming when a new covenant is going to be forged with God's people. And here's what Jeremiah says. This is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel. At that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Jesus took this meal that was symbolic of being delivered through the blood of a lamb. And Jesus becomes the Passover lamb through which all of us are delivered from our slavery to sin and death and united with Christ. And this new covenant is ratified such that when we come to this table, we don't come to know about God. We come to meet with God here. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. But memory is always intended to lead toward action. To remember something is supposed to change the way in which we live. My kids got an interesting lesson in this last week. Um, For the last number of months, we have been beseeching our children, summoning them into a better way of living. We have cordially invited them to join with us in the new life of when you remove the articles of clothing, you put them in the hamper right side out. There's some elbows out there this morning. Apparently, some of you have had this conversation in your home as well. So for the last number of months, every time laundry has been done, we have reminded our children, when you put your clothes in the hamper, make sure they're right side out, or in their terms, un-inside out. (laughs) But what happens every time? The next time we go to do laundry, the clothes are back in the hamper, right side out. So we decided to give them a mnemonic device to help them remember to live differently. Because every time we would call them on it and say, hey, haven't we talked about this? They'd say, oh yeah, I forgot. 
which I wondered, did they forget that the conversation had happened, or did they forget to live like the conversation had happened? I don't think they forgot that the conversation had happened. So this particular time, when the laundry was getting folded, it all got folded inside out <laughs> and placed on the couch. Then we summoned our child, nameless as they are, we summoned the child to come get the laundry off the couch, take it to their room, and we waited. About 30 seconds later, the child comes out and says, all my clothing is folded inside out. Do you know how long it's going to take me to unfold it, un-inside out it, and refold it again and put it in my drawer? And we said, only all too well. <laughs> and it opened the door for us to have a conversation in which we were able to say, I was able to say, do you know, for the last number of years, intentionally vague so as not to, uh, you know, get the innocent in trouble, to protect the guilty, actually. All these last number of years, you've been able to put your laundry away right side out. Do you know how much time it's taken primarily your mom to un-inside out your clothes and then fold them? And she's been doing that for you and your two other siblings and probably your dad, too, what if all of us were to live into this new way of living? Can you imagine how much time we would save? From that day on, my hope is that every time they were unfolding that, un-inside-outing that laundry and folding it again, they remembered the sacrificial love that their mom had given for the last number of years. And that remembering of mom's sacrificial love and repetitive action will actually help to form the behavior for the next number of years, right? Because that's the power of symbol, isn't it? The power of symbol is that it takes deep truths, enables, enables us to understand those deep truths and live into them in such a way that it changes the way in which we live. If our minds are dulled over time, symbol becomes the honing tool in which we sharpen our minds in order to live into a new way of living. In so doing, we become more effective disciples of Jesus Christ. So we are gathering around table today, a table that Jesus gathered with his disciples and it was rich with symbol that would help the disciples remember that the Lord had delivered his people through the blood of the lamb and we gather as a people who have been delivered through Christ's blood. But we gather at this table to re not only remember, but to be sharpened in order that we might become more effective disciples of Jesus Christ. When Jesus gathered with his disciples, he blessed the bread and broke it. And he said to them, whoever is hungry, come and eat. Whoever is in need, come, let us keep this celebration together. Let's gather around the table. Would you pray with me? Oh, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise. We thank you for doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. We thank you for the rich symbolism of the table, which reminds us of your body broken for us and your blood shed for us. We ask, oh Lord, that as we rehearse, we remember this, that you would help it to cultivate and shape our very lives such that we would become more effective, sharpened tools for your use in your world. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.